this. There it is. Okay. Welcome to the chapel. I'm so glad you're here today. If you're visiting with us today, usually we're a little more classy than that um, sometimes. I hope you'll join us following the service for Orange Juice in our Friendship Foyer. Um, also, if you're visiting, we want you to fill out a card there in the pew rack in front of you. Let, you, let us know that we're here so we, we can reach out and say hello and welcome you to our church today. We've got a lot going on. This is, man, October is getting busy, but let's start here in the pew rack in front of you. You'll see blue envelopes. We're doing two special collections today. The first one is for hurricane relief. Uh, we partner with Church World Service. They're doing great work in all the places ravaged by the recent hurricanes. So if you want to contribute to that, simply put it in the blue envelope, mark hurricane relief, drop it in the offering plate as it goes by. And the second thing we're doing, which I'm very excited about, is we're starting our collection for Rise Against Hunger, formerly Stop Hunger Now. Now, what am I holding in my hand? This is a bag of rice. Um, and other nutrients that will feed a family of six for a day. And this is what I hear you crazy people do. I hear you gather up, you put 15,000 of these bags together, and there are like 70, 80 of you that do this from ages 3 to about 300. And you do this on a Saturday, and apparently it's so fun that you don't want to miss it, and all people come together to make this happen. So we need about 75 volunteers, we need over $4,300, and we need you to come out on October the 28th, on Saturday, to make this happen. This is an exciting event. Um, following the service, if you'll go, and I think they want you to sign up, um, and also, in the blue envelope, if you want to contribute to our $4,350 goal, put it in the blue envelope and mark what? Rise Against Hunger. That's right. Okay, you guys are so smart. All right. Later this month, you'll get to install your good-looking new pastor. On the 22nd, I hope you'll put that on your calendars. Mark that. That'll be a big day. We'll have lots of special guests here. Uh, also, on the 15th of October, we're having a blood drive. So uh, I think there's a certain amount that we need to collect, and if we don't collect all of that blood, then, uh, then we'll take it out of Dr. Marilyn Michael. She'll give the rest if we don't collect enough. <laughs> Man's Search for God is a great program where we can explore our faith through science. Can you do that? Yes, is the answer. November the 5th, you're going to hear a little bit more about that in the next couple of weeks, but plan on being part of that. It'll be happening on Sundays after church, beginning November the 5th, as well on, as on Monday evenings, if that's more convenient for you. So make plans to be part of these exciting things happening starting now. Today is World Communion Sunday. And as we gather here at the table, we think about Christians all over the globe celebrating with us on this high holy day of holy communion. We think about Christians very different from us. We think about Christians in our own uh, International Council of Community Churches. We think about churches in Puerto Rico and Key West. All over the planet, people come together celebrating at the table of the Lord. So today we join with them as we remember our Christ and his sacrifice and the joy of being part of this great Christian fellowship across the globe. So let's come together as we worship, as we take the bread and the wine, as we remember who we are and whose we are. Let's worship together.
morning and welcome to Chapel by the Sea. It's October the 1st and I feel fall. Autumn is here, it's a little cooler, a little bit less humid and uh, it's a time I think about is the best season because I grew up on a peanut farm in South Georgia and we harvested peanuts and all our crops after that long hot summer. It was a time of celebration. Things turned gold, the leaves, the pumpkins, the asters. And it was a time I felt like it was rich in our reaping of a great harvest. So I'm wondering, in our sense of community where neighbor helped neighbor, can we take the opportunity to reach out to our neighbors, show God's love, and bring that sense of harvest to Chapel by the Sea? Invite someone to join you next Sunday. The call to worship. Today, we gather around a bountiful table to celebrate the freedom of God. Many. Bread from the earth and fruit from the vine, they are gifts to us of God's presence. Let us be bound in love, walk together in truth, and be united in purpose. For the, For the earth and all its fullness belong not to us, but to the Lord. Please join me in the invocation. God of our lives, your word is one of communion, not division. Your gifts are gifts of abundance, peace, and freedom, not scarcity, violence, and oppression. We thank you that in Christ you have given us the greatest gift. You gave us yourself. As we gather together, and your presence be received with joy and humility.
God has blessed us so richly. Let us return a portion of that to the work of his church and his community to show God's love to everyone. Our morning offering, please.
So all this was planned so that you'd recognize the fact that I'm not perfect. <laughs> we come to the Lord today with lots on our hearts and minds, our own personal concerns and worries that we all carry, as well as around the world, people hurting, people struggling. So let us bring our concerns as well as our praise before our God now. Lord, as we gather today at this table with Christians from all over the world, we ask your blessings upon us all. As we eat the bread and drink the cup, linking arms with believers around the world, pour your grace into us all. Grace us with your presence as we quietly and loudly pray to you. May we see in each other your light, your love, and you. May it not matter our differences, our names, our languages, our looks, our way of doing things. May what matter today and every day be that we are one in you. And as we pray, we call to mind our brothers and sisters who are unable to be with us today, whether in body or spirit. May you bring comfort to those who are grieving, lonely, heartbroken, ill, or broken of spirit. May you strengthen those whose lives feel shattered or don't make sense, those in crisis or experiencing loss. May you say the healing word to those who need it, May you bring the human touch of love to those who have not been touched. May you love the unloved through us. May you shine your light into those whose world is covered in darkness. May you use us to feed the hungry, to clothe the ones who need clothes, to give a cup of water to those who are thirsty, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick and those in prison. May lives be awakened to you, Lord, to your love, to your kingdom, whose door is always open to all who would ask, seek, and knock. And now we seek you in our private meditations. And praying the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture lesson today is from the Old Testament book of Exodus, beginning with chapter 17, verse 1. You can find this in your pew Bible on page 56. Now hear the word of the Lord. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? And so Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Thanks be to God for the reading of God's word.
<laughs> Excuse me, I was a little thirsty this morning. <clears throat> water, delicious, fresh water. If I had a little bit of extra money, my husband and I have talked about this, just like this dollar here, bill here, if I had a little bit of extra money, you know what I would do with it? I'd put it in water. Just like that. No, not just like that. That's silly, isn't it? I would invest in water if I had a little extra money. Now, I would question your intelligence if you were to take investing advice from me. But I do know that the people who really know about money are putting it in water. From big banks to Michael Burry. You know Michael Burry? The guy, uh, the subject of the film, uh, Get Short. The guy who predicted the housing market crash and made millions of dollars. He's putting his money in water. So they're putting it in water by buying up land with water rights. They're putting it in investments. They're buying up stocks with uh, water infrastructure and water uh, distribution and water retail, water technology like distillation, things like that. The CEO of Dow said that water is the oil of the 21st century. Why is water such a hot commodity, I wonder? I mean, if you go over there, there's a bunch of water, right? The Gulf of Mexico has a little bit in it. 70% of the earth is covered in what? Water. water. But did you know only 2.5% of the world's water is fresh water? And did you know that of that fresh water, some 99% is held in glaciers and snow fields? Ultimately, only 0.007% of the Earth's water is available to you and to me and to 7 billion of our closest friends. And that number is increasing. You know the 7 billion because the population of the Earth is expanding. The climate is changing. In developed nations like ours, the infrastructure is aging. And so we have situations like Flint, Michigan. We should all be a little bit upset about that. And we have situations like Puerto Rico. And so water is hot because those who predict the future and try to make money off doing that recognize the inevitability that soon enough there will be a scarcity. Supply and demand, right? The supply will be greater than the demand. No, I said that backwards, didn't I? Demand will be greater than supply. Thank you for all you economists out there. <laughs> so water, how many of you took a shower this morning? A couple of you, good, that's good. <laughs> How many of you turned on a faucet to make some coffee or tea? All right, all right. Ah, that will stop there. But when we do that, when we turn on our faucets, we don't think about where that water came from. We don't think about whether we'll have water again tomorrow unless we're getting ready for a five-category hurricane. We don't think much about water. And so this story of the Israelites in the desert without water may be hard for us to relate to because most of us haven't really experienced that kind of water shortage. And so there they are in the wilderness. Now, I gave these guys kind of a hard time last week. I called them, you know, I said they had grumpy crotchetitis, that they were grumpy. They didn't have food last week, and now this week they're thirsty, like they need water. But then I thought a little further, and I felt a little guilty because I thought if my children were hungry or thirsty, I might be a little grumpy too. This week they're more than grumpy, they are downright livid with their leaders. Just like you and I would be if we didn't have clean, fresh water. We'd be pretty livid too, wouldn't we? And so they're threatening to stone their leader, which we would probably do too. 
So Moses cries out to God, and in this 40-year journey, this cycle repeats over and over again. The people complain. God provides, wash, rinse, and repeat over and over again. They're 40 years in the desert. And this time, God provides the miracle of water from a rock. Pretty cool, huh? Wish I could do that. Pow! Water from a rock. Moses then names the place after the predominant question driving this whole episode. Is the Lord among us or not? Now to me, of this story, that's probably the most compelling part of it because the the shortage of water, I've never really lived through that. But I have lived through the question, is the Lord among us or not? Think about that. If you're a Christian with a brain, you've probably considered that question a time or two. It's a compelling question because we can't really see God or hold God in our grubby little hands. And we wonder from time to time when we see the evil and the suffering in the world. Is God among us? Hmm. Or we experience our own set of evil and suffering. Is God real? How could a loving God let X, Y, or Z happen? If you've asked that question or questions like that, you're not alone. It's a compelling question because most of us, in some form or fashion, have asked that question. So today, if you came having had that question in your past, or maybe you brought that question with you today, That's great, because this sermon is for you. If you are the rare individual who has completely perfect 100% faith, then you have my permission to take a nap. I'll wake you up for communion. For the rest of us, we'll consider this question. Is the Lord among us or not? So for the rest of us, my question to you is, just mentally in your mind, think about, When was the first time you asked that question? Maybe not out loud, but when was the first time you wondered, is this God thing, is that real? I've been in ministry for quite a few years now. I won't won't tell you how many because that makes me feel really old. But I've encountered several people along the way who have wrestled with this question, and I've been honored to have them bring that question to me. And I'll walk with them as they explore the answer. Is God real? Is the Lord among us or not? I'll give you a few examples. One example is this little boy in a church I served. He was so bright, so smart. He had figured out the whole Santa Claus thing at about the age of seven. Now he was the ripe old age of eight, and he wondered if this God thing was a hoax. But he came to church. His parents brought him to church. They taught then him in Sunday school, if, you know, whatever you need, just pray to God. Whatever you need, pray to God. Okay. So one day, this little boy, Caleb is his name, he had a stomach ache. And he prayed to God so fervently that God would remove the stomach ache. But the stomach ache lasted longer than Caleb wanted. Is God real? He wanted to know. Another time in my ministry, I was a campus minister at that place in Athens, Georgia. Blah. <laughs> University of Georgia. And I had a relationship with this young girl. She was um, 19, maybe 20. And she came to me one day. She was such a fervent and devout Christian girl, good, good gal. She came to me in tears one day. She said, I'm so angry at God. If God exists, I said, okay, talk to me. What do you mean? She said, there's a girl in my dorm, on my hallway, and she got pregnant, and she didn't want her family to know, and she didn't want to be a mom, and so she's thinking about having an abortion. And so some of us gathered up, and we prayed, and we prayed because knowing that this wasn't in God's will, we prayed that she wouldn't have an abortion, and she had the abortion, If this was God's will, why didn't God answer my prayer? She wanted to know. Susan was her name. 
So from eight-year-old Caleb to 20-year-old Susan, I'll tell you now about 60-something-year-old Ron. I honestly didn't know Ron very well because Ron had stopped coming to church before my arrival at this congregation. He stopped coming to church after the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. You remember that one, right? Killed over 220,000 people. And the enormity of that devastation, the enormity of the suffering, the enormity of the disaster made Ron decide if God was real and God could have stopped that, then why God wouldn't do that? So much for God, he basically said. So do any of those stories resonate with you? Eight-year-old Caleb, 20-year-old Susan, 60-something-year-old Ron, here's my story. I began to seriously, earnestly wonder, is the Lord among us or not? It was really after seminary for me. I was a young Christian minister, serving faithfully, and then someone I loved was dying and suffered greatly through that dying. And I lifted up prayers for healing, and as you've probably heard before, felt like my prayers hit the ceiling, and my loved one died. And for the first time in my young adult life, I wrestled with, why? And people say, well, God healed so-and-so, why didn't God heal this person that I love? Or God alleviates suffering, suffering over here, well, why doesn't God alleviate this suffering? And so someone turned me on to a book, many of you have probably read it, by Rabbi Harold Kushner. You know that book? Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. I recommend it highly. And this young Christian minister felt a little uneasy picking up this book by Rabbi Harold Kushner. But as I read it, what Rabbi Kushner did for me was reinvigorate, rekindle my faith in God. And what I had to do for Rabbi Kushner to help me through that, I had to let go of some ideas about God that didn't really work in planet Earth. I had to let go of some ideas about God instilled in me in Sunday school, church, and even in seminary. I had to let go of this idea of God being this kind of cosmic Santa Claus. I thought I was far more mature than that, but apparently not. This cosmic Santa Claus who sat around with superpowers, ready to zap a miracle here or there, but not here or there, and certainly not in the life of the loved one I had just lost. And so thanks be to God for Rabbi Kushner for helping me understand a new God. A God that doesn't sit around in heaven zapping miracles here and there, but a, a grown-up God who goes with us through that struggle. A God of ultimate love, of unity. And since that time, since Rabbi Kushner helped me rediscover God, that's been the gospel that I have preached. That's been the good news. That's been the driving force of my ministry to help other people find that God. <laughs> Along through that journey, I discovered this saying. Nobody knows exactly who said it. But it helped me kind of put the pieces together, make sense of this thing called life. And the saying goes like this. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. You've heard that. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And in that human experience in the wilderness that these Israelites happened for 40 years, you know what the life expectancy was back then for those Israelites? 30, maybe 35. If you lived to be the ripe old age of 40, you were doing pretty good. This was a lifetime in the wilderness. Just like you and I spend a lifetime in the wilderness called the human experience. 
a lifetime in this human experience where it's really hard to know if the Lord is among us or not. That's just called being human. So today, if you brought that question with you, that question that the Israelites uttered in the wilderness, is the Lord among us or not? First of all, know that you're not alone. You have lots of companions on that journey. And second of all, I want you to know that God isn't at the end of that question. That God with a capital G is right there in the middle of that question. God is with us in the wilderness once we let go of that idea of Santa, cosmic superhero, God with a little g, that most Christians I have met on the journey need to release in order to open up to God with a big G, the God of unifying love. That's the God I hope you can find in the middle of your question and at the end, but in the middle of it, too. I love how Paul says it. He says, now we see in a mirror dimly. Our view of God is cloudy. Then we shall see face to face, he says. So friends, today, thank you for coming to join those who quest to understand and know God, Big G. And here's the promise of Scripture. Ask. How does that go? <laughs> Ask and you seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. So my friend, as you ask, as you seek, and you knock, may the door be open to your understanding and deepened relationship with God. Capital G. Today, as we come to the table of the Lord, we remember Christians all over the world on that same quest to know God, to love God more deeply, more fully. And today, we think about those Christians all around the world, some on other parts of the planet who went home from church hours ago. It began last night as you were going to bed, World Communion Sunday. Asian Christians shared the bread and the wine. Churches in China met in secret so that they would not be arrested. Christians in the Middle East, some of whom were saved only by having dreams of Jesus, met under the watchful eye of the government as they celebrated the Eucharist. In Europe, Christians gathered in churches that grand cathedrals that used to be much fuller. In Africa, the sacrament was celebrated in great numbers by a growing number of Christians. Many bear scars of persecution as they commune together. Those celebrating today include Presbyterians and Methodists, Catholics and Lutherans, Pentecostals, Baptists, myriad other denominations, and easy, even some crazy interdenominationalists like us. Christ followers meet in public and in secret. Some meet in freedom while others gather under the threat of persecution and death. Some take the sacrament today with organ music, some with electric guitar, still others in quiet so as not to be discovered, arrested. In wealthy churches and in desperate poverty, the sacrament is observed. In churches, homes, huts, and in God's creation, this seal of the covenant is experienced. The bread is given to people that can overeat all day and to people who wonder when they get to eat again. The one thing in common, we all come to the same table of our Lord in many different languages, by ordained clergy and volunteer pastors, something like these words of institution are given. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. 
He gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he poured it out for his disciples, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this wine, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. We come, O Lord, as people of the covenant, ready to be filled by your Spirit as we take the bread and the wine into ourselves. Remind us of this one holy worldwide communion. Help us be mindful of brothers and sisters across the globe, especially those who suffer. O oh Lord, this bread and wine comes into our bodies to make us one with you. Help us release ourselves to understand you more. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. proclaimed here the good news of truth is heard in the telling of God's stories be open to God's word here given, we become what we receive. In the cup of love here offered, affirm what we believe.
sent as blessing for God's people to go forth in love and peace in our witness to God's kingdom may charity increase the bread of salvation broken for you. The cup of salvation poured out for you. Let us stand and sing the refrain of that beautiful hymn.
Thank you for this bread and for this cup. May it bless us that we might bless the world through you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, go, ask, seek, knock. The door will be open to you if you but search for the one true, all-loving God. Amen. Amen.